Hello everybody, this is Karma Killed the Cat, and welcome to your, I think, 20th Lua 5.2 tutorial. In this video, we'll be going over the first part of the string library. Uh, like I said before, the string library is a huge, huge library, so if we don't split it into two parts, this video would be probably over an hour long. So in this video, we're going to go over the, or just a bit more on how you use strings and what they are, how they're stored in Lua's memory. And then we'll go over the string functions that, that don't involve patterns. So, you don't know what that means yet, but you'll understand that in the second part of the video. So, we'll be going over the more basic functions in this video. And then, in the next video, we'll get on to pattern matching functions, which is a huge topic. Uh, it's a lot to remember, so get ready for that. But, for now, let's get started with this. So, before we move on to the string functions, let's talk about uh, how strings are stored in Lua and how they work. So, unlike languages like C and C++, strings are just variables, they're not objects, and they really don't have any special properties that are different from variables like numbers or booleans. So, they are uh, copied by value, or their value types, whatever you want to say. So, they're copied whenever you create a new variable that uh, it assigns to them, so, or is assigned to their value. So, if we were to say t equals nil, and, or actually we can say t equals s, so we are, or what we're trying to prove that's happening here is that uh, the value hello is copied into t, rather than t just being a reference to the string hello, which would happen if uh, hello was an, or the string was an object, not a variable. So, t equals s, and I'm not sure if Lua does this, but just to be safe, we'll just put some random statement here, and then say t equals hi. Oops. And the reason I have this print here, I just learned about this a few days ago. Uh, most C and C++ compilers, and probably compilers in languages like Java, and really most of the big languages, have an optimization feature where if you try to assign a normal variable to uh, different values in consecutive lines, so if we didn't have this print here, we'd just be saying t equals s and then t equals high. Most compilers would see that and realize that there's nothing you could do with t while t is equal to s, so it would just delete this line here and then leave this line. So I'm putting this print line here just in case Lua does that. Uh, the compiler can't remove it if there's a statement in between, no matter what that statement is. So if you didn't understand that, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm just doing it to be safe. You don't really need to know it. It's not very useful information. So now you can see what we've done is we've set We've set our original string to hello, then we've set our new string to the value of s, and then we've set that second string to a different value. So if, like I said, strings are not objects and they're passed by copy, then this t should be, a completely di should be able to store a completely different value than s, and s should still store hello and t should store hi. So if we print these out, say s and t and we run this, we get hello and hi, along with the one that we printed out uh, just to stop the compiler optimizations. So, this shows that strings are in fact value types and they're passed by copy, so strings aren't objects like they are in C and C++. And since they're not objects, that means that they're not arrays of string, or arrays of chars like they are in C and C++. So, you can't do the a uh, very useful feature of indexing a string. So if we were to s try to say s at position 2, uh, this should access the e in hello. And we run it, we get nil. So uh, I'm not sure why it returns nil instead of just uh, giving you an error, because uh, if s was a number, I think it would give us an error. Yeah, we get an error for that, but when t is a string, we just get nil when we index it. So not sure why that happens, but we cannot index a string like you can index one in C and C++. So that's all of the internal properties that you have to know about strings before we get started on the functions. So now let's move on to our first function, and it is string.length. So there are two ways that we could write any of the string functions. We could either say string.len, and then as a first parameter we give it s, our string, and you can probably guess what this does, it prints out the length of the string, it's five characters long. 
But there is an easier way that we can do this with the colon syntax we learned about in our objects tutorial quite a while ago. We can also say s colon len, and remember this implicitly passes the, uh, passes the object that calls it, or the variable that calls it, as the first parameter. It doesn't have to be an object, it can also be a variable. So it implicitly passes s as the first parameter to len. So this is exactly equivalent to the first call, it just looks a bit better. So 5. So now it's a bit more clear that we want the length of our string s. So you can do this with any of the string functions. All of them implicitly take the string you want to operate on as the first parameter. So uh, using the colon syntax will always work. So uh, you should definitely always use that when you can. Uh, this function is actually completely useless though because we can shorten it by just using the size of operator and we get the exact same thing. So there's really no need for the len function. Uh, it was just a good, easy place to start. The next function is string.rep, and what it does is it repeats the string that you give it as the first parameter for uh, as many bytes as you want it to. So string.rep and our second parameter will be, we'll give it 2 to the 20th. And you can see that we have created, I think, a megabyte of hello. And I may have just crashed the program, so I'm going to force stop it here. So yeah, you can see that it prints hello for 2 to the 20th times. It would have done that if I had let it keep running, but there's always the danger of crashing the computer. So uh, it's probably best to stop it. So the next function is string.lower. And to show string.lower, let's change up our string a bit. Add some capital letters. That's a zero. So now we have capital H, capital L, and capital O, and lowercase e and l. So if we were to say s colon lower, we get hello, but in all lowercase. And the opposite of this is string.upper. So we give it upper, run it, and we get hello in all uppercase. And characters that are already uppercase in the upper function don't get affected, and characters that are already lowercase in the lower function aren't affected. So it just converts all of the characters that it can. It, only, it can obviously only convert uh, letters. It converts them all to either lower or uppercase, depending on the function you use. So the next function is called string.sub, and it allows us to kind of pull out a piece of the string from our original string and return that. So say s sub and the first parameter is the index that you want to start pulling out so we'll say 1 and the second parameter is the index that you want to stop pulling out. We'll say negative 1. So 1 is uh, h here and negative 1 is o so let's actually change this to 2 and negative 2 just so we can actually see something happening. So now we have position 1 and position 2 so it'll start pulling out here then we have position negative 1 and negative 2, so it will stop pulling out here. So if we run this, we get ELL. Uh, we could change this to 2, negative 1. We get LO. Uh, we could just pull out one character, say 5, negative 1, and we get O. We'd say 1, negative 5, and we just get H. We can pull out any subsection of the string and return it as a value. You just have to know. Uh, where the piece of the string you want is in the uh, indices for the string. So this is really the closest you can get to indexing a string with the um, square bracket operator. It's not nearly as clean, but you can get the same effect. Like, say we want a string of position 1. We just say 1, negative 5. We get h. And so on. You can extract any position in the string. Uh, if you wanted second say 2, negative 4, and you get E. So it's not nearly as easy to use, but you can do it. And I think you can also call string.sub with just one parameter. Yep, and that will just extract from where you want to st from where you started to the rest of the string. So you just cut off part of the beginning of the string. So if you wanted just the last character of the string, you could just give it 5, and we just get O. So that's how you call it with one parameter, and it does pretty much the same thing. 
it just only cuts off uh, the beginning piece of the string. And by the way, since strings are variables, not objects, when we call this function, we're not actually modifying our string s, we're returning a completely new string. So if down here we just print s, we still get hello. So you can call these, this may seem like it's annoying, but it's actually very useful. You can call these uh, string modifying functions on your strings and not have to worry about saving an original copy of your original string. It will just modify the string and return a new one. So if you want to actually modify the string, you'd have to say s sub 5. So you actually have to set the return value of the function to your original string if you want it to be modified. That's just something to note. It's uh, pretty easy to forget. The next function is string.char. This is one of the few string functions that doesn't take a string as a first parameter. So string.char. And this converts an ASCII number to uh, a character. So if we say 97, that's A in ASCII. So if we run this, we get A down here. Uh, we could pass it multi -pra multiple parameters. So we could say 97, 98. 99, run this, and we get ABC. So this converts any number you give it into its corresponding character in ASCII. And we can also do the reverse with string.byte. And this takes a string, as usual. So we'll give it ABCD. And then it takes a position. And you can also not give it a position, and it'll just choose position 1. So if we run this, we get 97, because that's position 1 in the string, and uh, A is 97. But if we give it a 2, we get 98, we give it a 3, we get 99, and we give it a 4, and we get 100. So we can also try giving our hello string to this by saying s colon byte. Oops. Oh, I forgot to get rid of the dot right here. So it's still not... Oh, that's because we have a string as a first parameter. Now it should work. We get 72 for H, uh, for capital H, that is. Uh, that's why it's lower than lowercase a. And if we gave it position 2, we get 101. Position 3, we get 108. Position 4, we get 108. And position 5 we get 111. So that's the string.byte and the string.char functions. They're useful if you have uh, stuff that you want to convert to ASCII or an ASCII table that you want to get a character from. So it's kind of good for encrypting information like that. So it is pretty useful. So the next function is string.format and we're actually going to use a different string than hello for this. So we'll just say string.format and if you're familiar with the printf function or uh, scanf or any of the functions like that, you'll be familiar with this function. So it does pretty much the same thing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with these uh, uh, formatting functions in C, it allows you to interpolate variable values into a string that you're trying to print out using uh, special format codes. So we can say, uh, hello my name, oops, name is, then we can say percent %s, and period, uh, if I am percent %d, years old. There we go, and then as, oops, we need an end of string there. Then as the next x number of parameters, and x being however many uh, format codes you put in your string, you give it variables. So let's just create a random name here. Bob. And he can be 35. So if we run this, we get, hello, my name is Bob. I'm 35 years old. So what it did was it took these format codes. So it took percent %s, which means string in this uh, code. And it took the first parameter that we gave it after our format string Bob and put it in there. Then we have a percent %d, which means digit or number, and it took our 35 and put it there. We could also have more at the end. There is percent %f for floating point value, and uh, I know there are no differences between integers and floating points in Lua, 
but this just uses the exact same format codes as uh, the C functions do, so there is a difference between digits and uh, floating points, so percent %d you use when there's no decimal, percent %f you use when there is. So we'll say we're not, we don't have any example here, so 21.55. Then there is O for octal. Oops, uh, we put our percent %o right here. So percent %o, and we'll give it an octal number, or it'll convert it to octal for us, say 78. Percent %x gives us hex hexadecimal. Percent %x, so uh, we'll give it uh, 15. That should give us F. And if we run this, we get, hello, my name is Bob, I'm 35 years old. Uh, 21.5... Uh, yeah, 21.55, and then a bunch of zeros. If we didn't want all those zeros, we could say 0.2f. And then now we just get 21.55, so the uh, the dot and the number before the f is how however many decimal points you want. And then we get 116, that's uh, 78 in octal, and then f is 15 in hexadecimal. So that's how those pattern matching codes work. There's also percent %c for char, but that's obsolete in Lua, obviously. So these are all of the ones that you'll ever end up using. So that's all of the uh, non-pattern matching functions for the Lua string library. The pattern matching functions are very similar to string.format, or the pattern matching itself is very s similar to the stuff like percent %d, percent %2f, and uh, percent %o in the string.format function, except it's many, many, many times more complicated. So, if this clicked with you immediately, you'll probably have a decent time with pattern matching, but if this was difficult to understand for you, then it is going to be a tough time, but pattern matching is really useful, so it's very much worth understanding it, because if you're using Lua for what Lua's normally used for, uh it will be an incredibly useful tool to you, so it's very necessary to know. So stick around for the next tutorial, and we'll go over that. So I'll see you then.